Welcome to the Ad Astra podcast. Today we have with us uh, Professor Angela Voss. Um, she is a lecturer at the Faculty of Education at the Canterbury Christ Church University. And until very recently, she was the program director of the MA in Myth, Cosmology and the Sacred. She uh, has an expertise on music, Renaissance and Baroque music, and she is also known for her research on Marcio Ficino's work. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So um, could you talk uh, to us a little bit about your research work and what you've been doing? Yes. Well, it goes back a long way now. Um, I think I, I discovered... Uh, Ficino and Renaissance astrology and music and magic in my 20s, which is a long time ago now. Um, and I became fascinated by the connection between music and astrology. So that really sort of sparked off. I, I, was, I was a practicing musician in my 20s and I started learning astrology um, at the same time as I was playing a lot of Renaissance music. And I became very interested in the philosophy that informed both music and astrology in the Renaissance. So that's, that, that they were intertwined from the very beginning, really. Um, and I became introduced to Ficino's writings um, in my mid-twenties, I guess. Um, and there's so much astrology you know, in his writings. I, I began to read his letters, and there were letters that were addressed to friends and diplomats and church people, nearly always talking about astrology and transits and, you know, what was happening to Saturn, what was happening to Jupiter. And, um, and I was absolutely fascinated by the combination of, of his Platonic philosophy with his astrology. And I think how it all started was I, I almost felt him tapping me on the shoulder and saying, look, you know, no serious academic has actually shown how important the astrology element was to the whole Platonic revival in the Renaissance. So up until that time, this was like late 80s, early 90s, um, most scholarship on Ficino had concentrated on his Platonic commentaries and his Platonism, and they were slightly embarrassed by the fact that he'd been an astrologer. Yeah. Um, there was no real serious study of his astrology because at that time it was regarded as intellectually inferior and, you know, it's just not something that serious academics did. Um, so it was almost as if he was saying to me, look, you know, you've got to, you, you've got to, to sort of justify, you know, what I was, what I was doing. And it really felt like that, um, which is what led me to, Write an, or I wrote an MA thesis on his music, and then that led me on to write a PhD thesis on his astrological music therapy. Um, and then after that, things started shifting a bit, and, and I think scholarship became a bit more um, inclusive in terms of understanding how, just how important um, astrology, in, in a more Neoplatonic sense, you know, how important that was within the whole Platonic and Hermetic revival of the Renaissance. So I think I was sort of a bit at the forefront of that, really, and, and um, making that shift. It, it was in the 80s, so it was very brave of you because uh, your career as academic could be just killed at that point. Yes, I, I've never really thought in terms of um, academic career in that sense. I think I've always been extremely lucky in that what happened was um, that at the time I was, uh, well, after I finished my PhD, I, I then sort of stopped and I had two children and I had a few years sort of off from doing anything apart from being domestic. And, um, and then an opportunity arose uh, via a colleague in London to, uh, to do some teaching at the University of Kent. Um, and there was an amazing MA program running there called an MA in Mysticism and Religious Experience. 
So there was a sort of tradition there of an academic approach that was actually very participatory and very sympathetic to personal experience. Um, again, unlike most programs in religious studies. So I was invited to, to, to start teaching a course on Ficino for this program. And that's how I got a sort of foot in the door. And in those days, unlike now, it seemed to be quite easy just to sort of be invited to go to university and teach and be paid for it without having to do, you know, a, a lot of um, administrative stuff. <laughs> um, so that's how it started. And I was never thinking in terms of, oh, how am I, go how am I going to build up a career in teaching about astrology? I was always just thinking about this is my passion, this is what I love doing. Um, and it so happened that when I was at the University of Kent, um, my colleague Geoffrey Cornelius, who I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard of and who's, who's written a lot about astrology, was also in the same area and he joined me. And we started devising courses on astrology and divination um, that really involved a, a practical element, you know, that really involved understanding what how to practice astrology became part of studying the history of it as well. Um, and we introduced this into our courses. And then we were extremely fortunate in that a, a very large sum of money literally fell into our laps from a sponsor who wanted to bring astrology into higher education. Um, this is back in about 2002 or three. Um, and we were in the right place at the right time. Um, and so the university you know, never refuses large amounts of money. So <laughs> we, we started our um, MA program, which was then called the Cultural Study of Cosmology and Divination. Um, there was a lot of resistance from the university. Uh, so there was, you know, they, they wanted the money and they liked the fact we attracted students, but there was a lot of resistance about the astrology. Um, we had one student who applied for the course and sent in an essay, which was an astrological interpretation, not realising that, you know, that, that he shouldn't have been sending in that kind of essay as, as a sort of you know, application essay. Um, and the head of the school was so appalled, he, he banned this student from even applying for the course. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was that amount of hostility towards it. Um, but we, we managed to set up a successful program there until 2011, and then the money ended, and then we were pushed out. But um, it was just like I was in the right place at the right time to do that. And then there's another university in Can Canterbury called Christchurch University, and we met somebody there who was very sympathetic to what we were doing. And uh, we took three years to set up another programme there, which began in 2014, called the, called the MA in Myth, Cosmology and the Sacred. And again, it was about being in the right place at the right time and being in an education faculty, which was much more sympathetic towards a sort of participatory, reflexive approach than religious studies had been. So, um, you know, education already had methodologies set up which were quite creative which were about self-reflection journal writing you know creative creative projects so we were able to sort of slot in this much more um personal kind of way of approaching mm -hmm. studying these kind of sub subjects without anyone minding really or, or even noticing particularly mm -hmm. um so it's 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 like I've been following this sort of thread that sort of led me um, to the right, to, to be in the right environment that supported this up until now where the same thing has happened again and the education faculty has no money and therefore they're, you know, they're just getting rid of all courses that don't quite fit their agendas. So mm. the same thing has happened again and the course has now ended. But for 15 years, we were able to establish something quite unique um, where students could fully engage with their own practice as well as write about it in a scholarly way. Yeah, it is about, <coughs> about being in the right place in the right uh, time, but also 
with the right attitude. I think what you said in the beginning, it's not about career, although that is a consequence, a natural consequence. It's about really loving what you do. And that is, I think, the, 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 the factor that really makes the difference. Yes. I mean, it just didn't occur to me that I, I, I couldn't do this. You know, I've always just, I've had a vision and I've just somehow manifested it in some extraordinary way. And um, I've had such, and over the years, you know, I've had such amazing feedback from people on how I've written and what I've written. And um, I've always tried very hard to bring together a sort of engaged imagination with scholarship so that I so that neither of them it doesn't become a sort of you know new agey kind of rant but neither is it just sort of dry scholarship so I've always tried to bring together a sense of um, understanding the truth that underlies practices such as astrology and divination um, which can be shared by us now um, by entering a different mindset, you know, by actually shifting our post-enlightenment perceptions back to how the world was understood and actually thinking about, well, could we benefit from seeing the world in this way now? Yeah. Is this going to help us heal the, the dreadful split we're in at the moment between you know, science, imagination, science and religion, whatever these, 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 these splits? Um, so that's what I've, I've always tried to do in, in the way I've written, and I think it's yes, it's, it's kind of paid off. I've, it's been hard work. Um, it always is. <laughs> yeah, it always is. Yeah, but also uh, if you like it, if if it's something that you really love, uh, it's something that you just do because it's what you are. That's the, that's the thing. Yeah, I just think I've always been a bridge builder, and. Um, will continue to be, probably, yes. <laughs> and I don't have, I think also because I come from a very artistic background, you know, I've, I've never had a very strong rational scientific mind at all, you know. I mean, I, I find it very, very difficult to grasp things very, very logically and, and, and sort of um, analytically and conceptually. I definitely work with images. So coming from a musical background... Um, I've entered astrology, you know, through the power of the symbol, you know, through the power of the, yeah, the symbol to, to unfold and reveal meaning. And that's how I've always approached it. So I can't, I, I can't really, you know, I, I, my mind just doesn't work in the way that a lot of much more sort of rigorous scientific approaches would do. So that's another mm -hmm factor i guess i was i was thinking um your your initial research on music was in some ways rather practical because you were studying exactly how all of that operated and i think that was perhaps a starting point uh, to see how a technique or how a methodology that is being presented in the renaissance would be applied or how was it because it's a theoretical reflection, but at the same time, it has practical consequences. It's not just someone thinking about an idea, uh, it's something that can be put into practice. Yes, I mean, you know, you wouldn't dream of studying music really without playing it. Um, so, why study astrology without practicing it? And in the early days, you know, I was in the in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, I was, I spent a lot of time at the Warburg Institute. Um, and I was always very surprised at how people were studying astrology, but didn't seem to have any interest in actually practicing it. And I think, um, I think Dorian, you know, was the first practicing astrologer to, to achieve, um, you know, a PhD there. Um, of course, there, there were people there who was very, very sympathetic towards towards astrology. I mean, Charles Burnett and, and others. But the general tone of the, the academic study was to be very detached from the practice. Yeah. They, tend, very extraordinary, really. they tend to be very hygienic, as a, mm -hmm. a friend of mine says. Very hygienic. It, it is, uh, I understand in a way, I understand in a way because um, it keeps things separate. But on the other side, on the other hand, they would lose... Uh, much of the input of the uh, symbolic or imagination or the other part, the other part. Mm -hmm. So there's, as you said, there's this thin line 
or thin area between the new age rants and the dry academic analysis. So there's this, um, and here is where astrology lives, actually. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. It's um, <laughs> in, in this yes, middle, middle terrain. Middle it's term. perhaps where research can profit from both yeah. sides. That's, so we have the rigorous academic structure and then the experimental or at least the practical knowledge uh, that can join and produce something more, more effective or more, more yes. knowledge. Yeah. And I think that's the case with all subjects. You know, I think that there's this massive problem in our current education um, way of segregating out subjects, thinking that somehow they're all separate from each other. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my children went to a, a Rudolf Steiner in a Waldorf school, and the approach there is that everything is interconnected. You know, you do maths, but it's everything you present in maths is also extremely beautiful and artistic and you know, you're thinking aesthetically about it and um so yes bringing these things together i think it's not just a problem with astrology i think it's a problem with every area of study that they've become far too separated out and far too stuck into little boxes um, yeah, and people expect them actually they expect no academic knowledge to be dry and and it isn't because knowledge is beautiful it's interesting so and i mean all sorts of knowledge so i don't know maybe we need to rethink our uh, educational system oh, that will be for another podcast <laughs> <laughs> well we we, wrote, we recently published a book called re-enchanting the academy which is um an attempt to do that you know attempt to try and redefine what constitutes academic study to involve um, the sense of enchantment, the sense of magic, the sense of um, really mm -hmm. passionately loving what you do and bringing that into how you study, bringing yourself personally into your study without sacrificing any scholarly rigour. Um, yeah, just healing these these enlightenment splits, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you mm -hmm. want to...? Oh, okay. Uh, um, well, I, I would like... Um, to ask you questions about one of your fig central figures of your research, of course, uh, Marcelo Piccino, which, as we all know, is, uh, well, one of those huge figures of the history, intellectual history uh, of the Renaissance. Um, and exactly, now now moving to, to a different kind of thinking and the, the introduction of a different kind of thinking at a different age, um, how do you see... Um, well, this is a very complex question, I understand, but how do you see um, his main impact on, on a change, a definite change in the way, this, in this case, astrology was conceived or at least was thought about? Um, well, it was enormous. I mean, it was absolutely massive, I think. Um, and it was connected to the influx of Platonic and Hermetic thinking in the 1450s, 60s, 70s. Um, and I think it was the, it was the fact that um, okay, let's try and put this sort of simply. Um, obviously, from a very early age, he was making horoscopes. He was he, he must have had a traditional astrological education. You know, he knew all the techniques. He was he his was, father was a physician, I think. So I, I think his father was a physician, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, his father was a physician. That's right. Therefore, you should know at least a little bit yes. of astrology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was obviously doing this from an early age. Mm -hmm. And he was also obviously very attracted by Platonism from a very early age. There seems to have been a kind of, I think he was, he was trained in Aristotelianism, he was trained in traditional theology, and he kind of rebelled against this when he discovered Plato and um, realised there was a, a whole other dimension, a whole other way of looking at theology. Um, and somehow, you know, in his early years, astrology and philosophy began to come together. And he realized that traditional astrological techniques were not serving his platonic vision of astrology or his platonic vision of, of philosophy. Um, and that, um, and this was all connected with his own horoscope because he was born with Saturn on the ascendant in Aquarius. And everything he understood about Saturn from traditional, traditional astrology was quite negative. You know, it was about Saturn bringing a life of poverty and misery and ill health. 
And yet, from a Platonic point of view, Saturn is the highest planet, and it's right next to the divine mind, mm -hmm. and therefore it is the planet of the highest possible wisdom. So he was left with this sort of dilemma, really, about how do you reconcile the planet of the highest possible wisdom, mm -hmm. this traditional malefic um, definition of Saturn. And that seems to have been a, the sort of catalyst for him to reform mm -hmm. astrology, in a way, into, instead of seeing it as, as any kind of fatalistic or deterministic um, prognosis kind of practice, which I think he saw a lot of his fellow practitioners in Florence practicing it in this way, um, it became for him a symbolic method of raising consciousness. Because if Saturn is the highest wisdom and he had it right on his ascendant and he knew that you know, from a very early age that his destiny was to... Um, was to follow in the footsteps of Plato and Plotinus and to um, remind people of that their souls were immortal, basically, um, then astrology also had to reflect this. And therefore Saturn was not just a planet that would doom you to misery. It had to reflect the fact that it could raise you to the highest possible enlightenment. So that led him to kind of re revise the whole... Um, understanding of the symbol, the symbol of Saturn, you know, as pos as you know, he says himself that it can either, if you if you live a worldly life, it'll just come at you, and you know you you, you maybe um, you won't be able to get past the sense that you're doomed to a life of misery. But if you live the life of a philosopher, you understand that actually it has the gifts of study of contemplation of, of um, spiritual depth and that's how he embodied it and how he lived it as well as understanding that he had a very melancholy temperament which he would alleviate through music. Um, so Saturn became the symbol of the highest mind um, and from there I guess his whole astrology began, began to be much more humanistic what we might call humanistic you know, in the sense that he starts writing to uh, correspondents about taking responsibility for their own birth charts or taking responsibility for their, the way their own um, planetary cycles move, you know, that, that they are the master of the stars and um, astrologers who try to tell them what's going to happen or to predict their fates is just keeping them locked in a kind of you know, earthbound um, state of unknowing, whereas this deep sort of Socratic self-knowledge um, is something that seeing the planets more as stages of development that you understand within yourself and working with them will actually lead you to eventual um, religious enlightenment. It will lead you to a sense of oneness with God. <laughs> so it was quite a radical shift that he made um but of course he was working in a christian culture so this was this was an added difficulty uh because obviously he was surrounded by by orthodox churchmen who could, didn't see this deep spiritual implication of, of a symbolic implication of astrology and just regarded him as as practicing you know magic and illicit mm -hmm. stuff. Well, that, that is what you said, what you just said, all the ideas that he puts up in front. Uh, uh, I had um, researched on determinism in astrology because I had a postdoc in Germany and I had to, th this was my topic. And it's so interesting because he, he says all this, but, um, and he, he places himself as the opposite of medieval astrology. But those ideas were like incipient in medieval astrology, as you know. I'm sure you know. And uh, you can find them in, well, not perhaps in Hellenistic, perhaps not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far. But in um, Ptolemy, you know, the, the being responsible <clears throat> or the fact of knowing in advance can lead you to more more knowledge leads to more choices that kind of idea probably never clearly stated but it's there 
even if you remember the, the, the text I studied for my PhD, and you were one of the examiners in my Viva, and uh, the text I study is very Aristotelic indeed, but there's still there the idea, if you read, um, especially the last interpretation, the last horoscope, it's written by the author, not copied by, from others, the idea is like um, there are, we can find the seeds of these ideas like floating through the Middle Ages. And probably when they get to Ficino, he comes to put them together and uh, vocalize them. And he yes. expresses them yeah. in yeah, a way agree. that is articulate and complete. Yes. And I guess it's, it's the fact that he wasn't a, you know, he wasn't just a professional astrologer. You know, he, he was a priest. This is, you know, he was a, he was a canon of Florence Cathedral, you know, so the interesting, that's the interesting, I think, um, combination that he, he brought, that he, he brought astrology into the whole religious sphere and began to see it as a spiritual discipline, as opposed to being a professional astrologer. Um, well, of course, the astrology also became part of his medicinal practice and his healing practice. Um, so... Yes, I think I think the whole question of fate and free will, you know, bothered him. You know, his entire life. I mean, he's he, he's continually writing about these these um, huge questions, which we none of us can ever solve. Um, quite how much we are fated and how much we have free will. But it seems that he was quite angry about. Um, we don't know exactly who, but. He, when he wrote his, he wrote his uh, a little book called The Disputation Against the Judgment of Astrologers in 1477, which you probably know, uh, which was never published as such. We don't know why, but excerpts of it were um, in his later works. And um, it was like a bit of a foreshadowing of Pico's Disputations Against Astrology. But in this work, he um, spends pages and pages and pages um, really destroying a kind of literalist approach to astrology where astrologers say, oh, you know, this planet is this and it's going to do this. And it's, and he takes a very a Platinian view and says, no, you know, this is, we, we don't, astrology doesn't work like this. Astrology is symbols of the divine mind. They are signs sent by God, which we are signs, mm -hmm. yes, like Bacon. Ba well, Bacon is a bit shifty when it comes to signs. and the, Yeah, but it is, it is the same idea. The, the 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 thing is, could he be uh, like uh, directing this criticism to certain specific yes. authors? Because we can find this in medieval, and I, I yeah. have to yeah. talk about medieval. Yeah, and I was considering this is also a time where we see uh, the beginning of the popularization of astrology. So you have this the low, low, low understanding of astrology, it, it, very basic. Yes, and it is a time where that very literal approach to astrology that we see in more popular almanac starts to really um, draw be, some weight. Into, be disseminated, yeah. yes. And probably he's talking about this low um, quality astrology. Because if you go to, to read uh, medieval astrology, you see that... Um, well, it's not, they don't, they don't put it as Ficino does, of course not, but the idea of free will yes. is implicit. Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, well, we don't know exactly who he was directing this against, but um, what he seems to be wanting to say very strongly, and it comes out in this treatise, is that, he says it several times, astrology isn't reason or science, it's poetic metaphor. Mm -hmm. And he stresses this. So this seems to be the point that he wants to make, um, that, may, that, that the astrologers who are not seeing it as poetic metaphor are therefore stuck in a literal sort of cause and effect. Yes. And he says as well that if you're, that the astrologers that are stuck in cause and effect and, and, and tell their clients, you know, speak in that sort of way, then they're subjecting them I mean, it's quite modern and psychological in many ways. You know, they're then making them think that this is going, thing is going to happen, therefore it will happen. Mm -hmm. They are imprisoning, uh, creating a prison, like creating yeah. a prison mm -hmm. of mind. Yes, I understand. And of course, for a placeness, you know, to be to, to have this sense of autonomy of the soul is absolutely vital. So, and he calls these astrologers petty ogres, you know, and he, <laughs> they're, they're subjecting they're subjecting everyone to the fates. But so. 
whoever they were, he was definitely trying to bring a different perspective, which was a deeply, deeply religious perspective towards towards astrology. Um, and of course, then a very magical one, because then he brought it into practical theurgic magical ritual, which um, I think he discovered through reading the Amblicus, you know, and once he brought together Plato, Plotinus and Jamblichus, you know, he had a whole philosophical system that included ritual practice um, in which he could play music as well, you know, and um, use his astrological knowledge to play the right kind of music at the right kind of time to help people use their imaginations to mm. contemplate you know, certain planetary archetypes, we might say, and align themselves. So it all became part of a much bigger mm. project. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. Do you think these ideas, which were, because they were all um, put together, synthesized by him, so they were um, new in this sense, uh, do you think they had immediate impact or would it be, uh, I'm asking this because the author that I studied seems to be completely oblivious of this, and he is a contemporary of Ficino. Do you think it will have, like, it would take, like, uh, one or two decades for his ideas to have an impact mm -hmm. in practical terms? Yes, I think? because I, I was thinking, um, my, my research currently has been mostly on and the end of the 16th century, 17th century practices of astrology. Um, by by Jesuit priests, so so it's also another another, another yeah <laughs> another religious um, so uh, environment uh, again uh, although in a different nature, and uh, I was wondering and I've been looking into the the changes in 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 the astrology at this period and I was looking trying to figure out how exactly would these proposals by Ficino would change. Would, the practice. The practice. Um, it's very you, difficult. It's a difficult, we difficult realize question. Do you have any idea or do you have any thoughts on we that? We don't have those many examples. So, Well, I would see these practices really going through the more sort of occult magical line. So you think of people like Agrippa and John Dee and Robert Flood. Um, and perhaps as well. Um and William Lilly, I mean, William Lilly, I think, owes a huge amount to Ficino, where he says, I think in his preface, how the more religious or the more spiritual one is, the more efficacious one's astrology will be. I mean, that's really straight from a sort of Ficinian idea. So I guess it, a lot of it depends on the temperament of the astrologer. You know? A lot of it depends on the orientation of the astrologer. Um, I mean, certainly Ficino's ideas of... That he, that he took from Plato of the idea of the altered state of consciousness, so the idea of divine frenzy, the idea that true prophetic knowledge comes through if you're not in a normal everyday state of consciousness and you, you know, through your, um, through your ritual practice, you, you've been sort of, um, you, you're, you can speak to the angels in a way, or you, and, then, and this is where the truth comes through and astrology then is an aid to that which is very theurgic, very neoplatonic. I mean, a, a, the only astrologers of a certain temperament would be able to take that up and want to move mm -hmm. in that particular way. Other astrologers who are much, much more rational in their approach will be doing slightly different things. So I think, I think his influence was, I mean, was very much through the, the, the kind of polymath, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of Renaissance polymath who saw astrology as part of a bigger picture often involving magical and occult practices. So you think it would impact mainly in um, educated people and spiritually oriented people? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. And, and oh. those who um, thinking people like John Dee, you know, I'm thinking of... Really? Um, he mentions talking to the angels. He mentions in the, yes. in the, in the preface of mm -hmm. Christian astrology, you will be talking to the angels. Mm -hmm. Something like yes. that. It's, actually, it's a consciousness raising project. Um, it's not. It's not about foretelling the future. I mean, that, that these are the two rival sort of interpretations of astrology that we're still with now, aren't we? I mean, we're still very much in a world where most people think astrology is telling the future in some sort of concrete way, yeah. and that the divinatory aspect of it is highly suspect because that seems to take people into this sort of occult world, which you know 
And I think it's because we've lost, of course, the central, the very central um, idea that holds together the Neoplatonic idea of astrology is the power of the imagination. You know, it's the power of the human imagination to link together the, or to, to um, lift, you know, the, the concrete symbol into um, layers and layers and layers of higher meaning. And not everybody has a, what, what Jung would call the symbolic attitude and is able to actually do that. So, you know, I guess that's also part of it, that the symbolists work in a way where the symbol just opens up and opens up and eventually leads you to the one, the oneness of everything. And for others, it's much more of a sort of, you know, concrete kind of analysis of, of specific things. So, yeah, there's a different approaches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, oh, yes. One, one thing that I would like to ask you. Um, is this, you know, one example of a larger movement uh, in his time? Or he's, let's the, say, the root. a special person that embodied that? Do we find his peers uh, with similar ideas? Or do you think he's a more isolated figure, which then spawns uh, a way of thinking? in some ways quite isolated I mean I think um, he seems to have been you know, very very influential in his particular circle which was the Platonic Academy loosely called you know in Florence and um, there seems to have been oh, well I don't I mean I, I may be you know totally ignorant about this but in the 1490s when Savonarola appeared in Florence and Pico seems to have had this mysterious allegiance with Sonarola, which no one can quite understand. There's something so mysterious going on there. Um, everything seems to just sort of stop in terms of this wonderful vision of, you know, platonic mixture of astrology and magic. And until we come to people like, I guess, Paracelsus and Agrippa and people who start taking it up again. Um, but I, I can't think of any contemporary people apart from him and his circle, you know, in Florence who were working in that particular way. I mean, there may have been, um, there may have been, but it, it was such a, a drastic um, thing that happened in the 1490s with Pico's disputations, you know, influenced by Savonarola and which was such a, a blow to astrology in the sense that not only was, um, deterministic astrology thrown out by Pico, but you know, all forms of, of divinatory astrology seem to be thrown out by Pico, which is so mysterious because Pico and Ficino were working together, you know, on, on magical invocations, on Orphic hymns, on, you know, and suddenly we find this, this treatise which seems to demolish the very roots of any kind of astrology. And, um, and then, you know, in the 1490s, Ficino sort of leaves Florence and starts writing very nervous letters about, oh, saying, I've never believed in astrology. I was only just saying what Plotinus said, as if, you know, really fearing for something. And and it was recently discovered, I think, in the 1940s that um, Pico had, be, had died of arsenic poisoning. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, who knows what was going on in, mm -hmm. in, in that, that time. So, I guess if there were other, other astrologers practicing this way, they went underground. And, um, and I think it's, it then re-emerged more, perhaps more in the fields of, of, of medical astrology and occult practice. And, um, but he does definitely seems to be a bit of a, a unique one-off you know, in his time, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he has, he has like an impact in later authors. Uh, for instance, um, Yehuda Bravanel, uh, Leone Ebreo, uh, with his uh, Dialogues of Love. Yes. Very well, we haven't touched on that aspect, of course, but the whole, uh, yes, there's a lot of astrology in um, Pacino's commentary on Plato's Symposium, um, where he's talking about you know, the whole universe bound together by love and how Eros is the, the daimonic force that, um, by, and how Venus overcomes Mars and 
And I think, um, yeah, the question of love and the question of um, Venus as the kind of um, revival of the divine feminine as a sort of Sophia figure. I mean, you think of something, you think of a painting like Botticelli's Primavera and Birth of Venus and these, these sort of evocations of the divine feminine and the power of Venus as the human soul. So Ficino talks about, I don't know whether you know the letter where he talks, he's writing to a, a young member of the Medici family about his astrology and his horoscope. And he focuses specifically on Venus as human nature um, and how this young man needs to cultivate the sense of virtue through paying attention to Venus in his horoscope and, and the moon as well, paying a particular attention to the, to the moon. So there's something's coming through which is intensely feminine, you know, to do with cultivating these soul qualities of love and um, uh, the moon, of course, being the intermediary between the upper heavens and the earth. So the moon being absolutely essential in any practice of, of magic where you're trying to attract influences because it's the moon that will convey them to, to the earth. And of course, the moon is related to the Virgin Mary, it's related to um, the sort of intermediary between God and humans. So, and then he writes this, this treatise on love, which is one, I think, the most popular text that he ever wrote, commenting on Plato's Symposium. Um, so yes, that all sort of becomes interconnected as well. The, the, the revival of the divine feminine at this time. Yes, yes in this, uh, in um, in the dialogues of love, we have phil- uh, the dialogue, of course, between Philo, a man, and Sophia. A yes. woman. So yeah. we have this philosophia, and uh, I think that is uh, the idea of Neoplatonism that was like. Uh, Gaining roots in that period. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, and I think throughout the whole of the 16th century, you can see the Neoplatonic ideas taking root, particularly in literature. I mean, I think um, in literature, in music, um, in art, um, and by the time you get to the end of the 16th century, um, of course, in England, there's a huge hermetic revival in the arts. Um, and we haven't really talked much about the hermetic revival and the Corpus Hermeticum, but I think that was equally as important as, as the Neoplatonic texts with the idea that um, astrology becomes a journey of the soul, you know, from earth to heaven. And therefore, knowing one's astrology is about knowing how to cultivate the virtues of each planet so that when you die, you will sort of discard all the negative ones. And then when you incarnate into the earth, down to earth, you accumulate the, the qualities of each planet. So the journey of the soul and hermeticism, I think, influenced Ficino a lot and then comes back again in the Elizabethan Renaissance and influences the philosophers and the artists. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. Th- that is also very, very uh, patent in some of the uh, techniques, even medieval techniques, when the uh, the periods of the planets come from up to down, like in to pregnancy. Yes, the pregnancy or, Saturn, or, or, uh, or yeah, and, and then, then the ages of men from the moon to Saturn mm-hmm. and up. So when the pregnancy has to do with the downwards movement, and then the ages of men to upwards movement, and well, that's what you said and, 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 and this is our very old uh, it's really techniques old, old uh, the ideas of incarnation and transcendence through the sphere yeah, through the spheres. yeah. that's yeah. very interesting mm. um the, well the, the, this is one of the things the other thing that uh well it was already touched and implied but the relation between uh, Ficino and the church itself, the reception that his ideas might have or not have in the church, in the Orthodox uh, religion. Uh, how was he? Because he was a religious person? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, I think he was very clever. I think he's you know, it's one of these extraordinarily wise souls who was able to see both points of view and take the middle ground and he he seemed to know exactly how to put things in such a way that wouldn't offend people 
but unlike others who, you know, kind of yeah, just go like Giordano Bruno and such like who. <laughs> kind of, um, so if you read his his little treatise on astral magic, you know how to fit your life to the heavens. He's always saying things like, um, well, um, Yamblica says such and such. And of course, well, I say this, you know, I'm not agreeing necessarily. And, and then he'll say things like, and I'm not saying anything that will go against you know, what the church says. Um, and he was, but even so, he was um, taken up. Um, I don't, can't remember who it was now who, who sort of complained about him to the Vatican. And he did have to write an apology for this, for his book. And even there, you know, he's, he's, he's saying things like, well, you know, we all understand that the, the universe is full of life. You know, you can call it soul or if you call it life. Or he'll say something like, some people say the souls of the stars are um, just the, the natural life of the cosmos. Others will call them diamonds. <laughs> I'm not going to say what I call them. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. He, he kind of... He presents other people's views, and you can see that he's totally sympathetic, mm -hmm. but he's not going to sort of stick himself out there and, and oppose, because I think he, his, because his whole aim was, was reconciliation, you know, his whole life work was about reconciling um, what he would say is religion and philosophy, you know, pagan philosophy with Christian religion. He's always trying to find the middle way of showing how the Christian religion is an expression of a universal spiritual impulse that all human beings have. And that um, for him, there's no reason why it should be in opposition to another spiritual path that is pointing towards the same eternal truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's a position that, some, one of my favourite writers, Jeffrey Kripal, would call, you know, a third classroom position. It's like being able to straddle both worlds and go further. Mm -hmm. And he's having to deal with people who are still stuck in the oppositional space. Feel this yeah. on very cleverly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is also encompassing uh, some concepts of stoicism because, you know, the idea of pneuma, like being... A, in immanent to everything and um, composing everything, different concentrations of them. That that's the, these ideas. They are all like come together. And another thing that I find very interesting is that there is no opposition between religion and the practice of astrology. For instance, we can find this also in um, some other examples. For instance. I mentioned one of these in my 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 thesis. Um, this uh, I think it's the confessor, the the uh, a religious man. I don't remember his name of one of these um, the Marchesa of someone uh, like of an Italian uh, noble woman, and he advises her to pray at the moment that Venus, uh, sorry, at the moment that the 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 head of the dragon is. In the MC, so like pray at this moment because this is a moment where God will be more uh, able yeah. and the saints, God and the saints, exactly, will be more able to to that's, receive your praise. Yes, well, that's exactly exactly along the lines of what it's in the same lines. And even the author I studied says something about the horoscope. It's like there is some favorable planet related to the ninth house. I think it was Venus in the ascendant. Therefore, your prayers will be uh, heard by the saints and God because you have this connection. So there is this idea of um, this kind of marriage between spirituality and astrological mm. practice. Well, this is all, all to do with the power of the symbol, isn't it? It's all to do with... You know, engaging your imagination, and I think uh, Ficino says you know, the three most important ingredients for this this kind of work work to actually take effect uh, are um, power, timeliness, and intention. So it's like the sort of the power, what he would call the solar power of the heart. You know, actually kind of fully engaged with a total intention and total you know imaginative engagement with um, what they want this outcome to be in terms of of prayer. And the right timing, you know, and doing it, as you say, with the alignment. Alignment, yeah. Get the human intention and the planetary alignment working together, then, yes, anything can happen. You know, it's, it's, like, a, it's like that 
cosmic channel that you've opened. Um, yeah. And at the same time, they add, and I suppose Fitina would, would endorse this idea, if you do this at the right time, this is the will of God also. Exactly. It exactly. doesn't go against the universe. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. Because it's, it's like you are... Um, you are allowing the will of God to to actually act, and that's that that's really how astrology as divination would be seen to be working. You know that what you're doing is far from you know condemning people to a fate. You're actually allowing their path of good fortune, as God would will it for this lifetime, to reveal itself, so that so that you can become you know, as fulfilled as you. Your gifts can be fulfilled in this lifetime it's because you're following your path of good fortune, and that turns around, you know, negative into positive, and that so that would turn around a negative what you might call a negative experience into a learning experience. I mean, in that sense, it's a very modern approach. You know, you find modern psychological astrology completely comes from that sort of yes. mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. That you know, a bad Mars transit is. If you meet an angry person, you know it's actually what 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 what's that to do with your anger? You know it's it's, and that was understood then by by that way of practicing, so. bringing within the, the the archetype. But also at the same time, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just one question, and then I'll let you. Uh, at the same time, I, I suppose he was following the traditional rules. Oh yes. So he yeah. follows this, but he just takes another approach at them. Yes, and I think that uh, the shift is more interpretative than it was the technical. Question, yeah. You were also mm -hmm. wanted. I think because he doesn't he doesn't write a lot about the rules. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that wasn't his main area of interest. His area was more humanitarian in how could he use the astrology to help people. So when he writes about it, it's more in a playful way as well. You know, he writes to Lorenzo de' Medici saying, "Oh." Um, I think my letter was delayed to you because I had Saturn square Mercury the other day. <laughs> you know, don't I wouldn't make this journey tomorrow because you've got Saturn on your ascendant or something like that. It's a way of trying to help people, and he doesn't. He's not that interested in going into the technicalities with them. But obviously, for himself and his own practices, he would have used all all those techniques. He doesn't. He doesn't suggest or propose any changes in technique. He, cha he pro his proposal is to change the way they interpret things yeah i think his proposal is to um open people's symbolic imaginations mm -hmm. to how astrology could help them take more responsibility for their lives, their lives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah i think that would be mm -hmm. yes and i was wondering it probably uh, then what also tones down a little bit that kind of movement is the later the church really uh, gets very um, strict with astrological practice by the end of the 16th century with mm -hmm. the index and then with the bulls and, and it probably it also of, yeah. um, uh, turns down that, that kind of development or at least that kind of discussion gets a little yeah. bit more probably underground or more, more yeah. difficult to have, I yeah. would imagine. If it was already difficult at this time, I would imagine that it was. Later on, uh, more towards the 17th century, at least in Christian Catholic countries, that would be very, very difficult conversation. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think when you start getting much more of a polarization between the occult practitioners, the church, and the rise of science, because you, you get now, you start getting the, you know, in the following century, you start getting the rise of a purely scientific, objective stance towards the world, which splits even more um, the idea that your soul is participating in a in a greater universe, and I think that's probably what has done more damage than anything else. Um, also, it would be interesting to 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 see because one of the main um, objections of the church uh, to astrology is the idea of determinism, but. As you, as you know, I'm sure you know, it's kind of a misunderstanding of determinism because people from, I don't know, from the early ages, they always say, look, this is for you to, to understand their tendencies or whatever. Uh, and only a few uh, probably less educated people would be strictly, you know, strictly deterministic. I don't know, but um, one of the main, one of the main uh, objections would be determinism. 
Church would say astrology is deterministic, therefore it's against it. Uh, it's against the will of God, or it's against the human free will. This approach by Ficino would take this, or at least a great part of this, so there would be no more uh, objection, or at least the objection would diminish significantly. So probably the scientific factor that comes into play at this point would be the main the main problem, so to say, would be... Well, I, 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 yeah. I don't know if I agree with you with that. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I agree with myself. <laughs> um, well, I, I was just thinking of um, a kind of a, a sort of recent correspondence that one of my students had with a, with a bishop, um, a local bishop about this, which seemed to highlight the confusion, actually, that surrounds this area particularly in the Church of England, and I'm not so sure, you know, obviously Catholicism will have its own, well, yeah, well yes, the, the, the confusion is, I think, because the whole idea of the symbol being intermediary between humans and God became eliminated, you know, the, the, it became, um, uh, what would you say, the tele, it's like the telephone wires were cut, in a way, in the Enlightenment, and so the symbolic lost its power and it it became reduced perhaps you know we say reduced to a sort of superstitious uh, element um and then and then sort of objectivity and sort of rationality took hold so the church finds itself in a very difficult position because its whole its whole way of um uh what should we say of educating people is to do with the soul, and the soul is a, is a profoundly symbolic entity. It's not a rational entity you can cut up and divide, and you know. And it's always relied on music, and it's always relied on ritual, and it's always always relied on all these symbolic things. And yet, when it comes to astrology, because of the because of the Aristotelian um, and astronomical factual basis of astrology, there's a great problem because. Astrology does seem to work in predetermined cycles, and therefore people can make statements about if this planet is there, it's going to mean this, and and so you get the whole fate bound thing. And I think um, the, I remember the response that that the student had from the bishop was um, that the movements of the stars, yes, can signify God's will, but as soon as you start as soon as astrologers start assigning fates to them, then it's illicit. Mm -hmm. So we're back to the medieval idea that the natural astrology is... I think it never changed, yes. I think the idea, the central idea has never changed. Uh, it's still the same thing. As soon as there's a fate or there's a, a rigid, let's say, outcome put forth, then it violates uh, free will yes. and it cannot be done. It, it's not acceptable. Uh, for a Christian precept. I think that's always a, their problem. Um, and that's where, where it lies. Uh, but it, I think it's, it's, a very, it's a very complex discussion. And I think what you say, what you say it, 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 and the, the church sees that turned against, against itself uh, at the end, uh, well, at the beginning of the, of the 18th century, when all the arguments it is using against what they call superstitious practices astrology included in, in, in that bundle, then it's turned by, by the, the Enlightenment is. against, uh, against uh, the, church. the church itself. So it's, 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 it's a very... And uh, it was not the first time. I remember you mentioned something earlier. Right in the beginning of Christianity, there is this uh, line of thought that really accuses Christians of being very deterministic. Exactly. So <laughs> I don't recall the name what of, the, of the like philosopher. The Greeks? There's one of the of the old philosophers. It's more or less the same period of uh, Augustine that he does, does, that he, he does the contrary argument and 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 attacks Christians. It's not, but this is like human nature, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's it's this isn't really to do with astrology and Christianity specifically. This is to do with um, a literal mindset versus a, a symbolic mindset. It's to do with the kind of conflict that always seems to arise between um, those who can see the bigger picture and those who can't see the bigger picture. Yeah. Those uh, who see the forest and those who see the tree. <laughs> yeah, those who see the tree, exactly. And <laughs> those who don't. I mean, it's, um, it seems to be a fact of, of human nature and 
there seem to be periods in history where there's a kind of there is this sort of synthesis and there's a creativity when when people are able to or the wisest of uh, you know people are able to see the way these work together and then they seem to split apart and Ficino himself talks about this and he talks about periods in history where where um, what he would call religion and philosophy split apart mm -hmm. and then there's tremendous conflict and there are periods in which they come together with great creative um, impulses you know for human beings and and he regards himself as um, put put there in Florence in the 15th century by divine providence to bring these two things together and he sees that's what he would see the whole of the perennial what we would call the perennial wisdom or the ancient philosophy or the esoteric traditions you know as being in aid of this and you know I would say we can see this now we can we can trace that right through to people like Jung in the 20th century who I think was another spokesperson for this 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 synthesis and way of understanding and i think you know transpersonal psychology is a very um the discipline of transpersonal psychology is another way of of, of being able to synthesize these things I, i think the whole new age movement is you know however however clumsy and and sort of botched and a bit ignorant it may be sometimes at the at the essence of it is this desire to heal this split and we just need I think we need more education we need more deep thinking about this we need more more people who are involved in the new age movement to go back to the roots of what it is they're doing and the spiritual and metaphysical implications of what they're doing um, and I think it I think there was a lot happening at the moment I, I've been absolutely amazed by This is in the past few months of the lockdown, you know, the number of groups and people are springing up to want to try and heal the world through some kind of more um, healing of conflict through um, understanding through the heart rather than the head and you know, all these sort of things. I think there's, there is something that's really happening now that hopefully will, will bring a shift. But whenever you get that, you also get the resistance and the, and the split. So I think we're in a very interesting and critical time mm. at the moment. Mm. It's always this game of a reaction, a counter-reaction, and a counter-counter-reaction, and you have this balance. Yes. And also, what begins as a good idea, like, let's say, the New Age movement, can transform into something very messy. And then there's the movement of rejection and uh, also as it merits, but then it transforms into something very dry. And then there's again the movement. And so it's, it is like, uh, again, conflict between two extremes. And uh, I think each person, and even academically speaking, has to find their own middle point, so to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in the academic world. Um, I don't know what it's like where you are, but in England, um, there's an absolutely massive problem now because the universities all have, they were losing huge millions and millions of pounds um, because students are just not signing up. And um, everything's becoming extremely tight, very conservative, very um, rule bound. Um, my feeling is that the really exciting things are going to be happening outside the universities now. Um, and yeah, I can't quite see how they're going to hold on really because, well, we'll have to see what happens, but we will find a way. I mean, we <laughs> as humanity, we will find a way. <laughs> find a way. We always do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Yes. Well, okay. Uh, on this, um, on this hopeful, uh, hopeful note, note, exactly. <laughs> Worried and hopeful. Note. <laughs> oh, hopeful. Yes. Uh, we thank you very much for for joining Sorry, us in the podcast. It's been a great pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you very uh, much. And well, we hope to to see you again in the future in other conversations. Uh, That would be lovely. Yes. Thank you very much. It's been yeah. great.